four classes all the students are well acquainted with ms dio uh, she has taken classes on different aspects of indian history uh, she is and she is the assistant professor in university of delhi and we welcome ma'am you uh, as for the today's topic is concerned uh, in continuation of the last class last day classes it is another aspect of uh, the administrative and, institu and institutional set up or structures of uh, medieval indian history particularly the delhi sultanates the vijayanagara brahmanis the moguls and uh, of course the pre british 18th century 7 uh, 18th century after the moguls and before the uh, coming of the britishers uh, this particular phase is totally different from the early phase like the late uh, early medieval or late historic and the uh, early historic phase the political setup of the early historic period starting from the mauryan up to gupta had some similarities with minor changes and in the after post gupta period there are in disintegration of the empires however up to harsha who united the empire on the north there is a harsha on the east there is sashanka on the south there is kulabeshi so this vast empire was divided into three under three major banners or major dynasties after 647 after the death of harsha did uh, 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 major political institutions were demolished and divided into several minor kingdoms under the minor chieftains chief, chief, chief and the administrative system was totally demolished it is only of after the coming of the slave dynasty or the delhi sultanate a new set up totally new set up because uh, up to up to 1206 the early system was to some extent it was continued but when the uh, delhi sultanates they came they introduced a new type of system which was totally based on the afghan turko afghan um, style and uh, especially after the, the uh, coronation of uh, balban who was actually a slave when he declared himself as a uh, sultan and after uh, Uh, one ikta from uh, he received from the khalifa he uh, maintain a different type of structures for the political institutions or the, the delhi sultanate polity he uh, introduced a new system and it was continued up to the mughal period when the mughals came for babur and humayun there is no time they were totally busy with the war and conquest it was only akbar and uh, before akbar the uh, shir shah so he set up a uh, similar type of um, political structure but it was after uh, akbar who actually he established a new system which was based totally different from the sultanate uh, institutions sultanate structures of polity and he introduced a new system which was a mix of indo and islamic system both the rajput systems and the mughal systems uh, it was continued and very beautifully he ruled After, again his successors were ruled in, in very in smooth political uh, um, atmosphere and after aurangzeb when aurangzeb was died the dynasty in the whole dynasty was again disintegrated and the small chieftains were again raised in different parts of the indian subcontinent and the system was totally different from the earlier uh, period and the small rulers they have their own system of rules and when the britishers came the indian political structure and institutions were out of the scene and british introduced their own system so today's class is based on this theme and with this brief introduction now i would like to request miss priti dio to start her lecture yes miss dio thank you very much dr sakir husain for uh, giving this uh, elaborate uh, um, introduction to the topic that we will be covering today uh, good morning everyone and i welcome uh, our students uh, studying this particular course and also our uh, colleagues at um, the orissa state open university from different departments like um, um, uh, some of you who attended my lecture yesterday uh, we are, i'm going to take up uh, uh, 
the period after that so yesterday we were looking at the administrative and institutional administrative and institutional structures uh, before the uh, uh, the medieval period the early medieval period from the earliest time to the early to the early medieval period and uh, today i will be looking at uh, uh, structures uh, political structures and administrative institutional structures uh, from in the medieval period per se so we will be covering period until about the 18th century so um, if uh, uh, nishant can tell me if my slides are visible i can proceed uh, yes ma'am okay it's great visible. thank you so um, uh, the topic for today is political structures in india administrative and institutional structures uh, specifically in the medieval period please remember the period that we are going to be covering today is from about the 11th century um mostly from the, about the 12th century with the establishment of delhi sultanate till about uh, until the, the britishers uh, came and colonized india so that's the time frame that we are looking at today so this is going to be from your e resource mhi 04 block 6 and uh, semester 2 students master, master of history students ma history students are going to uh, are actually at present studying this so um, let's begin so the broad themes of this unit, uh, we are, it's divided into four units, the Delhi Sultanate, which is primarily the North India, but we will see that how they really expanded towards the Deccan and the Peninsula region also. Unit two, the Vijayanagara, Bahamani and other kingdoms. So this is primarily the Peninsula India that I'm going to be discussing. Unit three will be the Mughal Empire. I'm sure all of us are familiar with uh, the studies on the Mughal Empire, uh, which encompasses entire, almost the entire Indian subcontinent, except for you know South Chola, uh, uh, the south, um, the southernmost part, which was, which had a, um, which was not under the Mughal Empire. And Unit four, which is the 18th century successor state. So I would like um, uh, uh, to, all of you to just keep two things in your mind. First, the map of India at this point of time. Uh, broadly, uh, the regions that uh, these dynasties and sultanate and empire had encompassed. And second, remember um, the time frame. So uh, because we're looking at almost what, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 700 years. So we're going to be covering at 700 years in this particular uh, you know one hour that we have been allotted so um, uh, i will be spending more time on the delhi sultanate unit and uh, partially look at um, uh, uh, about five uh, about 10 minutes each on uh, the second third and the fourth unit so let's look at the delhi sultanate so this map that i is in front of you i've uh, downloaded it from the internet and this is primarily the delhi sultanate at its pinnacle so even within the Delhi Sultanate, uh, at the time of, so I'm, I'm taking it for granted that the political history would be known to all of you. Political history, I mean that um, uh, the, who came after, the which ruler came after, uh, you know, which ruler. All of it, the chronology is clear in your mind because uh, on the basis of that, uh, you will be able to understand the administrative and institutional structure. So I, I hope you know that uh, Qutubuddin Aibak came to India, established power, but it was Iltutmish, his slave, who actually uh, declared himself the Delhi Sultan, the Sultan of the Delhi Sultanate. And it, it was after him, from him rather, that uh, the consolidation of Delhi Sultanate really started. So um, when Iltutmish came in, you know, uh, he um, it wasn't that the entire India was under him. It was just a bare belt of northern India that was under Iltutmish. But gradually, with the Khaljis and the Tughlaqs coming in, um, the Delhi Sultanate expansion really uh, started happening full-fledged. And this map particularly shows um, the Delhi Sultanate under the Tughlaq dynasty. So uh, if you um, are not familiar with the chronology of the political history, then I would really request and urge all of you, some of our students who have not looked at the chronology, to first look at the chronology and timelines and then refer to this lecture. Or keep the chronology of the political chronology uh, next to you, read that, understand that, and then look at the administrative institutional structures. Because otherwise you will get confused with names, uh, who is coming when, you know what, because every ruler was trying to consolidate his uh, rule and um, uh, to consolidate his rule, he was trying to bring changes in the administrative and institutional structures. So you have to be very really clear about, you know, at least the chronology of the political rulers. Yes. So you can see that uh, going back to the map, you can see that the Tughlaq dynasty had almost covered, you know, an uh, established rule in the entire India. So um, in, in subcontinent. Now, 
when you also look at the Delhi Sultanate, you know, just four points I would like to give in the background. The first being the first point of my slide, the beginning of the dynastic monarchy, that means the Delhi Sultanate was seen as the beginning of dynastic monarchy. Now, what is the term dynastic? Dynastic means um, a particular family se rulers ban rahe, a dynasty se by birth us, us, us dynasty se um, rulers ban rahe. A dynasty rule kar rahi hai. Okay, so the beginning of dynastic monarchy can be traced to Umayyad Caliphate. So, if you remember, uh, some of you who had attended my lecture on the rise of Islam and the Caliphate, the Umayyad Caliphate um, uh, saw that the concept of monarchy, the sorry, the concept of the Caliphate uh, and the and the caliphs in the Umayyad Caliphate um, uh, established the idea of. Um, uh, the caliphs coming from one particular family, one particular dynasty. Okay, and this was further strengthened during the Abbasid period, the Abbasid Caliphate. Yes, so the beginning of dynastic monarchy can be traced to the Umayyad Caliphate, and uh, it was marked by dominance of Arabs and unity of Muslims. During the Abbasid period, that means the Abbasid Caliphate period, elaborate administrative systems were instituted several departments were kept and uh, even uh, the concept of uh, the uh, the bizarat bizarat was also existed in, and it had a persian uh, origin so uh, i am not particularly talking about the delhi sultanate in india at this point of view, the delhi sultanate i'm giving you a background to where this delhi sultanate is coming from where is this sultanate coming from it has its lineages it has its legacies from the in, from the region beyond the Indian subcontinent, and this region is the West Asia, the the Iranian uh, uh, subcontinent, the, the the where the Sassanid Empire was there, and later Abbasids had uh, Abbasid Caliphate had established its uh, capital. So please remember that the Sultanate, which was established in Delhi and was called the Delhi Sultanate had its background and um, uh, moorings from the uh, that part of the continent the west asia or you can call the central asia you know that part of the the world these people are uh, coming from and they have their cultural and their institutional backgrounds from there so even the institutions that you will see that they are trying to bring and establish in india in delhi and or in their Delhi Sultanate. I won't use the word India because that's too modern a term. But yes, the Delhi Sultanate, uh, the institutions that they are trying to establish is coming from uh, 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 or some elements or some characteristics are coming from different parts of the, um, the Iranian, the Persian and uh, the West Asian influence. Okay. The second point, which is under the Ghaznavids, both ability and hereditary uh, influence of su uh, influenced succession to throne. However, under Mahmud, um, uh, uh, um, dissent became more important. Uh, they did not believe in partitioning the empire, whereas Ghorid did resort to. So we will also see that the Ghazna or Ghaznavids did not really, um, uh, they were influenced by hereditary su su succession. And they, they um, uh, actually uh, believed in partitioning the empire. So the Ghazna uh, family, the families in Ghazna would partition their region, their empire into smaller you know, regions and give away. Uh, but Ghorids did not resort to. Uh, so the, the Ghaznavids came in first and then the Ghorids. Please remember that chronology also. Ghorids, though initially were subordinate to Ghaznavids, they conquered Ghazna and they invaded Multan in India. Both Ghaznavid and Ghorid trace their ancestry to ancient families of Turan and Naran. So you see that constantly um, uh, we cannot really, uh, in fact, we cannot ignore, forget about denying, but we cannot ignore the lineage and the influence that uh, the, the sultans of Delhi have, you know, from the regions uh, beyond the Indian subcontinent. And please remember this uh, 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 particular aspect very, very uh, uh, carefully. You know, Kutubuddin, who was Kutubuddin Ebak, I'm talking about, who was a slave of Gurid ruler. After that, Iltutmish came in, the Turkish slave officer and the son-in-law of Kutubuddin, who became the governor of Badaun. 
okay later made uh, delhi as his capital in dutmish made delhi as the as his capital and thus the delhi sultanate the name and established himself as the independent ruler of india and beginning of the delhi sultanate so please remember this brief four point background to uh, what the delhi sultanate is now the most important aspect when we look at the administrative and institutional framework of the delhi sultanate is the sultan himself his capital that means the area the region that he is staying in his capital the nobility and the ulama now let's see what are these aspects the sultan was the node of administrative apparatus he was the absolute commander he was a supreme commander of the army so these are the features of sultan these are the these are, these are some of the aspects that can be associated with the sultan he was the head of the administrative system he directly controlled uh, the center which is the capital city he was his presence in the capital city was of course very central and the adjoining area so if you look at the delhi sultanate not only delhi but the entire region around that the entire northern belt you know those areas um, uh, not the entire northern belt but the entire Gan northern gangetic belt yes that all of that had almost direct control of um, uh, the the sultan himself uh he he mostly um, that region of where the sultan stayed and the sense the capital and the adjoining area so were mostly inhabited by professionals now who were these professionals these were namely the non agriculturalist groups okay they were administrative apparatus elaborate administrative apparatus and prominent prominently in this region which means the capital and the adjoining areas uh there was also need to introduce centrally monitored control and regulation now why was there gradual need of this centrally monitored control kyun chahiye tha ki ruler jo hai wo centrally control kare power ko kya reason tha pehla reason ye tha that political conquest of new area and insufficient control could lead to breakdown of the empire agar aap control nahi karenge to wo area haath se nikal jayega अगर आप कोई एरिया को नहीं इनसफिशिएंटली कंट्रोल करेंगे या उसको या उसको कैजुअली कंट्रोल करेंगे या नहीं कंट्रोल करेंगे दैट कैन लीड टू अ थ्रेट टू द सुल्तान हिमसेल्फ यू नो टू द पोजीशन ऑफ द सुल्तान इट कैन लीड टू द ब्रेकडाउन ऑफ हिज एम्पायर दैट ही इज ट्राइंग टू क्रिएट सो देयरफॉर अ सेंट्रल एक सेंट्रल एक केंद्रीय बोलते हैं ना केंद्रीय एक सेंट्रल कंट्रोल करना जो है वो बहुत जरूरी था सुल्तान के लिए सेकंड रीजन है रिसोर्सेज हैड टू बी अप्रोप्रिएटेड फॉर मेंटेनेंस ऑफ इट पॉलिटिकल स्ट्रक्चर आप अपना पॉलिटिकल स्ट्रक्चर कैसे मेंटेन करोगे आप उसको कैसे रन करोगे आपको उसके लिए रेवेन्यू चाहिए वेर विल द रेवेन्यू कम फ्रॉम revenue has to come from different regions from different occupations from different people in form of taxes revenue demands and and many other mechanisms so therefore resources had to be appropriated for the maintenance of political structure and therefore administrative central administration and institutional structures had to be uh, uh, formalized it had to be formulated it had to be strengthened and that's what the sultans of delhi did now the nobility and the nobles in delhi acquired prominence in selection of the ruler nobility had played a very significant role during sultanate period all right it wasn't just that the sultan wanted to be strong or he was a strong ruler and everybody accepted him no it wasn't like that the position of sultan was very vulnerable bahut instable thi sultan ki position aur wo dependent thi nobility pe agar nobility kush hai तो सुल्तान स्ट्रॉन्ग रहेगा सुल्तान को सपोर्ट करेगी अगर नोबिलिटी खुश नहीं है अगर नोबिलिटी नहीं चाहती कि कोई सुल्तान बने तो वो भी पॉसिबल है एंड दैट्स व्हाट हैपन इफ यू सी आफ्टर इलतुतमिश व्हेन इलतुतमिश हैड नॉमिनेटेड हर डॉटर राजिया सुल्तान द मोस्ट द पार्ट ऑफ द नोबिलिटी डिड नॉट एक्सेप्ट राजिया एज द रूलर सो डिस्पाइट इलतुतमिश Uh, nominating a, an heir to the throne razia sultana she wasn't really allowed to rule she ruled for a brief time and then there was a treacherous murder for, uh, you know there was conspiracy against her so the nobility played a very they were almost king makers they, they played extremely significant role during the sultanate period please remember a very important point that islam doesn't permit monarchical rule 
it only gradually developed over a period of time i have explained this uh, in detail during my lecture um, I, i don't know when i did take took that uh, it was one of the previous lectures that i taken on rise of islam please uh, listen to that lecture read that e resource to understand that uh, what did islam permit did they really permit um, uh, a monarchical rule a central rule or in in the political space or what else did they permit and that will give you uh, an understanding that why there was constant struggle uh, uh, and a war of succession uh, for uh, a ruler to come into power or a particular person to come into power so going back you know i don't want to digress too much because we have very little time um the going back the nobility in delhi sultanate played extremely important role nobility and the nobles delhi was the hub of political activity of turkish rule is tutmish accession was an important landmark in the growth of turkish nobility so uh, iltutmish belonged uh, he was a turk he was a turk and the turkish nobility played a very very important role in supporting kutubuddin ebak and iltutmish and iltutmish's family yes he established a sovereign turkish state and had efficient administrators balban when he came to power balban tried to restore supremacy of the crown by crushing the power of turkish nobility So Balban came not from El El Tutmish's family. He was a son-in-law, but he came from a different clan, different family. And when and Balban took fo power forcefully, in the sense that he uh, conspired and he, you know, he, he was literally uh, he took up and he wanted his family to become um, uh, after Balban. He, uh, he wanted his family to take control of the Sultanate, but that never happened. Um, he want so for so he tried to strengthen the position of the Sultan. by uh, talking about you know his own kingship divine theory of kingship that the king is most important he has um, he has powers from the god and he's a representation representative of god on earth so these are the kind of notions that he attached to the king to his to his kingship and just to strengthen the position of the sultan and uh, also this was done to uh, weaken the position of the nobles at least in the uh, the way nobility was looked at so um, he made uh, ability and force become more important after uh, became uh, an important factor in succession now when khaljis and tughlaqs came in the nobility opened to people from diverse backgrounds uh no more a uh, preserve of turks only it wasn't only turks who were present in the nobility but there were other non turks and you know other afghans all of these other kind of uh, other clan people other ethnic group people who were now a part of the nobility uh under the lodis except for the reign of sikandar and ibrahim lodi tribal concept of equality of afghans determined attitude towards nobility so um another uh, significant point to remember is that the lodis are um afghans yes so lodis and later sur sher shah suri we will not study that uh, about him today but lodis were um, uh, were afghans and they also followed tribal concept of equality of as uh, the there was no concept of ruler as such but then they followed a tribal con equality of uh, uh, and that dominated the attitude of the nobility nobility thought that nobody one person can take control of everything so even if the ruler is um or if a particular uh, a chief is becoming a ruler he must treat the nobles as one among as equals so that was the expectation of the nobility yes um uh, the third uh, important segment that is uh, in this particular section is the ulemas ulemas again in details i've discussed in my previous lectures they were theologians now institutional feature of political discourse of delhi sultanate so their job was that the political uh, so islam i told you when i was taking that lecture that politics and religion was pretty combined religion did not survive solely it could not so there was a close connection between political authority and religious expansion okay so the institutional feature of political discourse of delhi uh, ulemas played a very important role they were present both in the court and in provinces in provinces they were qazis they were uh, qazis were the uh, the legal and the uh, religious interpreters and who would uh, take uh, control um, not control but they were officers uh, in pro instituted in the provinces their role as preachers and guardians of islamic religion was important most of them came from outside the subcontinent indian subcontinent social moral censors they were they rose in power because of high judicial position held by them they could sway the king 
and nobility in favor so they had a very very significant role a very powerful role in terms of influ influencing the king and the nobles they held important positions in the administration particularly judiciary okay and their primary aim was to spread the religious word the religious word here means the islamic law the islamic religion they paid lip service to sharia and considered it sin if not practiced so they would constantly remind the sultan that according to sharia you should be doing this according to quran you should be doing this according to hadith you should be doing this so they were constantly uh, gu guiding the sultan to follow the quran and its precepts state laws were also made they were called zawabit and they um, uh, they were made actually these were laws that were made for smooth functioning of the state and if they were required for the welfare uh, and they were made basically um, uh, for some welfare measure in the state and even so these are new laws that were made for the welfare of the state now the ulemas have to agree to these zawabits that the ruler is making zawabits means these new laws that the state laws that the ruler is drafting for as a means to um, uh, uh, for the welfare of the state um, the ulama should agree the, so there was a discussion on these zawabits and whether they were in uh, consonance they were in cognizance with the sharia so you can clearly see that under the delhi sultanate religion and political uh, developments and political uh, moves were uh, quite interlinked now um, uh, they also the ulamas were the principals of uh, madrasas the educational institutions uh, coming straight to what were the administrative apparatus so at the time of qutbuddin aibak no administrative apparatus was formal, formally there el tutmish formally established various mechanisms a mixture of politico administrative institutions from central asia and west asia i already mentioned this point before in consonance with prevailing administrative structures in various parts of sultan so please also remember that uh, not everything was put into practice in the in delhi sultanate uh, uh, from the central asia and west asian traditions whatever was already existing in the indian subcontinent in different parts of delhi sultanate locally what was existing was maintained and that was integrated with the traditions of central asia and west asia that the delhi sultans were more familiar with so there was an integration an amalgamation a mixture of the the local traditions the administrative traditions and the administrative traditions that the delhi sultan got from or uh, 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 brought from the central asia and the west asian traditions so it was in consonance with the prevailing administrative structures in various parts of sultanate largely left to their devices to collect taxes send it to central treasury as tribute so the tax collecting methods and all of that was left to whatever was practiced before delhi sultans came in it wasn't really because there was already a system and delhi sultans did not want to uh, disturb that system of tax collection and all so they did not really interfere with all of that at this point of time you will see that happening in mughal period but at this point of time it was left as it is appointments of officers by sultan was there but it was only to assist the local intermediaries like the courts muqaddams chaudhrys they were already there in the indian village in the indian provinces for the longest time they were the local um, the ruling classes the ruling clans they were local um, intermediaries and uh, important men and they had the uh, officers of the sultan to um, in tax collection and other otherwise it was only from the 13th century onwards that the central authority in the outer realm was well established now coming to a very important administrative apparatus ikta ikta was a territorial assignment given to administrative officers and nobles in lieu of their services the holder of ikta was called mukti he was responsible for collection of revenue from his ikta and work there as an administrative head also so he had a dual responsibility aapko tax bhi collect karna hai aapko wahan jo prashasnik vyavastha hai administrative vyavastha hai us jagah ki usko bhi aapko samajhna hai aur usko stable rakhna hai retain revenue equivalent to their पर्सनल पे वो जो रेवेन्यू कलेक्ट कर रहा है जितना उस वो हकदार है अपनी सैलरी के लिए के अगेंस्ट वो रख ले और बाकी जो सरप्लस है ही हैज टू सेंड दैट टू द स्टेट द इंपीरियल ट्रेजरी द द सल्तनत ट्रेजरी 
he was also supposed to iktidar and the mukti had to also was supposed to uh, maintain a troops troops contingent of troops and he also drew salary for that troops to maintain that troops so that was also taken from the ikta land um a west and central asian feature ikta was already if you again remember my lecture talking about ikhlas and they and the ikta they really emerged in a big way during the abbasid period abbasid caliphate so uh, we again has see a lot of influence coming from the uh, abbasid caliphate and uh, particularly the indian system of ikta was uh, adopted from the seljuk pattern which is called the mustagal type of ikta that served as the foundation of political and military system of the turks uh there was also influence of mongol institutions so you also must have been uh, must be knowing about the mongol empire or the mongol institutions on the turkish rule um, uh, in india so mongol institutions also influenced the turkish rule in india for example the balban theory of kingship the idea of mongol khans that mohammed bin tughlaq had adopted for his khurasani nobles the egalitarian attitude of all uh, towards all subjects strictness showing strictness in administration refusal to give special status to ulema all ulemas were important but the sultan did not uh, give them um, an extremely special status they just they respected them but if the sultan thought that this uh, did not this should be done or should not be done and ulemas uh, they like it or they dislike it you know it uh, sultan would do so basically uh, a special status was given to ulemas but but they were not arbitrary ulemas were not uh, given powers absolute powers so this concept again is an in, is influence of mongol institutions there were also appointments of hindu in nobility uh, in the nobility the token currency experiment by mohammed bin tughlaq so all of this is an influence of mongol institutions on the turkish rule in india now sultans were very intelligent and they uh, were very practical they understood and they were aware that india had that delhi delhi sultanate was unique in its nature so they wanted political control uh, and they were politically controlling over largely over the non islamic subjects so therefore they were doing uh, they were uh, uh, most of the time they were putting into practice things were that were that were practically uh, uh, practical to implement to be implemented um, in the in, in the delhi sultanate the entire regions of delhi sultanate jizya was imposed on all even brahmins had to pay especially under the firoz shah tughlaq's time uh, now the measures were based on political experience right again again the political practicalities whatever was practical politically um, those measures were taken uh, that those that were necessary for political control that were taken not on the basis of religion and this is a very significant significant point there is a lot of discussion generally we think delhi sultan i delhi sultanate log aaye the wo apna religion phaila rahe the apna religion uh, wo establish karna chahte the i think these are very wrong notions because uh, when practically when we see them doing things they were not here on the basis of their religion or they were not here to propagate their religion they were here and they established their rule on um, on on principles that were based on political experiences political realities political necessities to control the region not on the basis of the religion that's very clear from historical sources and historical discussion and as students of history uh, we must understand this historical uh, um, so this point this which is based on historical studies rather than generalizing notions about delhi sultanate and mughal empire now jizya uh, was a lawful tax that was mentioned in quran and that had, had to be taken from all non muslims in lieu of protection of life and property and exemption from military service so jizya was taken then also again in my previous lecture on islam i have spoken about jizya this was taken from non muslims and um, uh, women children and illiterate however were exempted from paying from uh, a payment of jizya now uh, this will be the central administration uh, mostly it was carried out by trusted slaves uh, delhi sultanate initially the first uh, set of uh, uh, people were also called the slave it was also called the slave dynasty before the khaljis came and it was initially carried out by trusted slaves especially those who held the sultan's acquired throne loyalty was a prerequisite 
the important institutions uh, under the central administration was Bizarat. I'm quickly going to go through. This is the most important uh, institution. It was headed by a wazir and he was general supervisor of all department. He would be an advisor to a sultan. He uh, His main function was to look at finances, salaries, land revenue collection, expenditures. So broadly, he supervised over all major and minor departments. Then there was Divane Arz, which took care of the military organization, headed by Arz A. Mumalik. Uh, Naib A. Ul Mumulk, he was a deputy um, uh, of Ariz, and he could become very important. Again, these positions are very important. They could be a threat to the ruler also. For example, um, Balban, he was simply a Naib under uh, um, uh, Nas Sultan Nasiruddin Muhammad, but he killed some Sultan Nasiruddin Muhammad and he became the Sultan of Delhi. So uh, you cannot, one cannot really underestimate the position of these uh, important officials. Um, Divane Insha, that took, uh, uh, was the Department of Royal Correspondence. Divane Riyasat, who took care of the, uh, who took uh, care uh, of the market regulations, especially becomes important during Alauddin Khilji's time, who was, uh, who undertook large reform, revenue reform activities. And then we have Divane Risalat. They were, um, uh, they, this was a religious and legal matters were dealt in this in this uh, particular department. It was headed by Sadro Sadar. So broadly, these are few departments under the central administration. Under the provincial administrations, uh, provinces means the division of the, the entire empire, the entire Sultanate was small provinces, small um, regions. Now these provinces were largely outside the core political area. Now, in the beginning of my lecture, I've mentioned that the core area was the capital of the Sultanate and the regions around that. That was the core area. But as you move away from these areas, that becomes the provinces. These were regions outside the core area. They were under, they were divided into provinces. Now, the governor or the wali or mukti was the head of the provinces. And further, it was partitioned to divide into shiks or shikdar. And uh, uh, they again, um, administrative divisions that you can take a look from the uh, e resource. The governor, by and large, looked at overall matters of the administration. The ikta uh, was given to officials, and they were called iktadas. Their main responsibility was to maintain military unit on the behalf of the ruler, right? And the governor uh, was assisted by Ariz. Uh, Ariz, uh, again, I mentioned about this particular uh, uh, department in Divane Ars, a military organization. Uh, local administration comprised of the Mukaddam, Patwari. So now these are familiar names. They were already a part of the local administration from time without beginning, in the sense they were already always there. And it was just that the Sultanate officials collaborated with them to collect revenue, to do to maintain peace and order there, and all of that. So the governor, which was a who was a representative of the Sultan, had to work in conjunction with the local administrators like Mukaddam, Khuds, Chaudhri, Skarpun, etc. Uh, army was very, very important. Again, smaller contingents had to be maintained by um, the Iktidar in his provinces and uh, the governor. But there was also a standing army or a st uh, st stationed in Delhi, the capital of Sultan. It was called Hashmi Kalam, Hashmi Kal. Now, uh, coming to the revenue administration, uh, the primary source state uh, that land revenue was the most important source. Village was the basic unit. State had held large, it, in fact, state had reserved a large tract of land, which was called Khalisa. So the, uh, all revenue from the Khalisa would come to the Sultan directly. But the largest part of land, more part of land uh, that was uh, apart from Khalisa were uh, those lands from where Ikta was given. Okay, Ikta was given, the land grant was given to the, uh, the different officials in lieu of their services. Allowing Khilji uh, time, we see that land was measured, revenue was determined, and uh, Kharaj, which was the land tax, there were other taxes like Jizya, uh, which you, of course, we've discussed, Zakat. Uh, these are taxations that um, uh, uh, the taxation principle by and large was followed on the basis of the Hanafi school of Muslim law. Again, please take this context, read from the source to understand what it is. Barni, Ziauddin Barni, an important writer, contemporary writer of that point of time, in his Tariqe Firoshai, he described three taxes, Kharaj, Charai, and Ghari. 
um uh, avva were additional assessors that were time to time uh, uh, levied on the people to get more revenue from the uh, uh, from the population from the subjects sondhar were agrarian loans and that were let out by mohammed bin tughlaq during his um, uh, for agrarian uh, purpose for agrarian expansion or agrarian purpose um they were let out by the mohammed bin tughlaq during his reign ikta was a grant that was lay made from kharaj land to officers called mukti and these land uh, grants that were given were not hereditary that means if an iktidar gets a land an ikta land he doesn't have that for his entire life or in his uh, generation next generation it was an hereditary no entitlement was there to the ownership of that land land always belonged to the tiller the peasant so there was no uh, no way that the iktidar could consider that i am the owner of this land no he was only taking certain amount of revenue from that land in lieu of his service to the state please remember this point smaller iktas were given to maintain troops and uh, mohammed bin tughlaq task of maintaining soldiers and collection of revenue so during mohammed bin tughlaq's time the role of the iktidar uh, of as an administrator of collecting revenue and of maintaining troop was separated okay uh, idra pensions inam gifts were also given as land revenue assignments uh, were given so even uh, give uh, in, in form of pensions and gifts they were given so overall a complex cohesive administrative network we see during delhi sultanate period the authority of the sultan became more concrete especially gradually when we see construction activities were being taken place of course the sultans were becoming more prosperous and they could they were established more formally and concretely and that's the reason they involved themselves in construction and other activities uh, which strengthened their positions further mosques madrasas were built for umma that means community prayers that islamic principles of religion to talk about army mustered and most important for the expansion army was very very important and gradually we see that al sultan was only becoming strong with a very very strong army at its disposal appointments were made on the basis of checks and balances and they were also tactful uh, uh, tactfully they were working along with the local power even though a new system of administration was introduced at top level only minor changes were made at the local and pargana level so it was a combination of both the foreign elements and the local elements when i say foreign i mean the central asian west asian influences that the delhi sultanate is having okay so by and large this was in the past about 25 30 minutes that i've discussed uh, is um, uh, the delhi sultanate which was predominantly the first unit of my of of your uh, block of your study now coming to the coming to the vijayanagar empire and bahmani sultanate let me just show you through a map the yellow portion in the map um, is uh, the bahmani kingdom um, if you can see uh, bidar gulbarg bijapur hampi this is the rangal uh, devagiri golconda these are areas and ahmednagar these are areas under bahmani kingdom and the green portion the shaded green portion is the vijayanagara kingdom uh, with its towns mysore kanchi kosikot tanjore madurai vijayanagara of course bellary so these are uh, places kollam these are places in um, uh, of bahmani and vijayanagara again i'm talking about the peninsula and south india at this point of time um um now vijayanagara and bahmani let's understand that what was uh, what were their uh, administrative structures uh, in during the medieval period now vijayanagara empire was established in about 1336 ad on the banks of river tungabhadra uh, king was the monarchical head advised by council of ministers administrative units uh, were called rajyas that means the provinces were called rajyas the provincial provincial form of government was there in vijayanagara and bahmani both Okay, uh, they ceased to function when Nayaka system uh, was established by Krishna Dev Rai. So, Nayaka system, which is my next third point in the slide, I'll explain. After Nayaka system was introduced by Krishna Dev Rai, a very very important ruler of the Vijayanagara period, uh, Vijayanagara Empire, um, uh, we see that the system of rajyas had ceased. And I mean, they, they it, it, it ceased in the sense that uh, this it, the system of rajya stopped uh, functioning, and it was Nayaka system that was introduced by Krishna Dev Rai. Now, what is Nayaka? Nayaka or Nayankar system? matured in the later period of the uh, of the uh, vijayanagara empire nayakas were category of officials appointed by the ruler with rights of land 
they could parcel out a portion of land to others in return for some remittance of revenue and other services to superior authority nunes the portuguese chronicle a chronicler stated that there were about 200 nayakas in vijayanagara empire nayakas were pillars of support for the king as well as at times rebelled against him so this was broadly the feature of nayaka again of administrative system with which the vijayanagara ruler is controlling its huge region uh in local and or village administration was called the ayagar system where every village was separate was a separate unit 12 functionaries were collectively known as ayagars and they were appointed in each village by the government that means the central government the ruler the vijayanagara ruler and once allotted these 12 functionaries once they were appointed the office becomes hereditary the concept of hereditary was there hereditary rights were there in the in the ayagar system ayagar could sell or mortgage their office tax free lands were given to them which were called manias they were granted to them for maintenance for perpetuity alauddin hasan established uh, when coming down to the bahamani kingdom alauddin hasan had established the bahamani kingdom in 1347 ad he tried to subdue those who favored tughlaq rule okay and uh, again if you know a little bit about what bahamani uh, kingdom how it emerged they emerged uh, actually um, um, as against the delhi so those nobles who were against um, um, uh the delhi sultan uh, they got together uh, uh, and um, formed this particular kingdom so th those who had subdued um, those who were um, uh, 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 against the tughlaq rule um those nobles who were against the tughlaq rule in, in uh, tughlaq rule in the in the in that region in the region of bahamani they um, uh, formed this kingdom against the as against the delhi sultan they tried to win over the local chiefs how did they do it now it's not easy to um, um, uh, rebel against the sultans right so they did this with the help of the local chiefs and through that support they uh, they uh, rebelled against the sultans and formed the bahamani so i'm not going to go into the details of the political uh, setup of the bahamani kingdom but the king itself the bahamani king stood at the pinnacle of the administrative system he was assisted by host of other officials constituted in similar patterns so again the functioning of the the administrative functioning of the delhi sultan of the bahamani kingdom was quite similar to the way a uh, delhi sultanate function the patterns of delhi sultanate two groups of nobility afakis and dakhnis they played significant role there was also constant clash between the two groups um, the noble nobility groups the afakis and dakhnis and these factional struggles had actually resulted in a lot of instability in the bahamani kingdom mahmud gavan uh, a very prominent personality in the bahamani kingdom especially because he strengthened the bahamani kingdom during his lifetime mahmud gavan was made the tarafdar of bijapur na taraf the taraf is a province tarafdar is almost like a governor of the region so mahmud gavan was made the tarafdar of bijapur he tried to bring conciliation between the two groups of the nobility and with gradual rise of mahmud gavan bahamani kingdom witnessed unprecedented territorial expansion and a provincial administration was recognized under him and the biggest bigger tariffs uh, divided were divided into eight sir uh, uh, lashkar ships the provinces of medium size again not going into details please look at your e resource he curbed the power of the bigger tarafdars and became powerful mahmud gavan and his reforms however were not appreciated by the nobility class in the in his region in the deccan and after his death there were a lot of conflicts that again uh, came up between among the nobles and that led to the disintegration of the bahamani kingdom uh, um, i'm not going to go into the details of bengal and malwa the other two kingdoms of um, uh, in this region um, um, uh, please look at it from your e resource uh, in this unit i've just in this uh, unit um, of broadly the medieval period uh, institutional administrative uh, net uh, structures i i only intended to look at uh, vijayanagara and bahamani kingdoms which i have just discussed in the past two slides 
Now, going further to the third unit of this particular uh, uh, block, let's discuss the Mughal Empire. Now, this is the Mughal Empire. And um, you can see that Mughal Empire extended north, south, east, west, the entire regions beyond the, uh, the regions of Pakistan, you know, and uh, the, so just look at the vastness of the Mughal Empire. So let's understand that how this Mughal Empire administratively uh, uh, functioned, yes? The Mughal Empire, um, uh, the political structure uh, under um, the Mughal Empire was influenced. The Mughal rulers were influenced from the structures, administrative structures that of Afghans. That means the Lodhis and the Sur. So Lodhis came in, of course, before the Mughals and the Sur, Shesha Suri. The, uh, he was he was also in between came after Humayun and then of course was defeated by Humayun. So by and large the Mughal administrative structures were influenced by the Afghan system of administration. They were the forerunners of the Mughal system of administration. They were also influenced, Mughals were also influenced from Delhi Sultanate, the concept of Ikta that eventually developed in the, as a Mansabdari system in the Mughal Empire that also uh, saw its influences from the Ikta system of the Delhi Sultanate. And the Lodhis had influence in the way that they, uh, uh, the Jagir, the word Jagir and the reference to Jagirs had developed for the first time as a revenue assignment. Um, uh, and it gradually developed as a, as a form of revenue assignments during the Mughal period. So again, the Mughal administration was not, everything was new or novel. They also had uh, uh, great influences from uh, the, the preceding uh, 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 rulerships of Afghans, the Lodhis, the Sur's, the Delhi Sultans. Several changes were, of course, introduced under the Mughals. The Jagir and Mansa became the most important novel feature introduced under the Mughals. Uh, a territorial unit was called Suba, uh, and the head was the Subedar. Shikdar was subordinate to the Fajdar. Now, a lot of these names are familiar to you because we've already seen them in the other regions. Um, changes in administration were brought about uh, to bring high degree of centralization in imperial edifice. So uh, you can see, like, like I've shown you in the map here, that Mughal Empire is huge, it's vast. And how do you control this? So the Mughal emperor always believed and sought to centralize control, apne heart mein control rakna. So he is doing and he is making everything in administration work so that he could control the power, control power through his um, uh, institution, his uh, his uh, his uh, imperial institution. So large differences uh, were made were seen between jama the assessed revenue and hasil the actual collection and this was a constant problem that the uh, revenue administration faced during the mughal period you can go into the details of this from your e resource the mughal mansabdari system was modeled on the now again like i've told you the mansabdari system uh, saw its uh, influence coming from the ikta system sorry uh, uh, yeah the ikta system to an extent and also the mongol mongol concept of yasa Yasa, which meant which meant decrease of Chinggis Khan. Now again, please look at your e-resource for more details on this. The Mansa meant rank. Now Mansa means rank, and it was expressed in numerical terms. Aini Akbari, which was written by Abul Fazal, lists sixty-six ranks, though in practice there were only thirty-three that were utilized. Each Mansabdar maintained a sanction strength of contingent. Dag and Chaira was introduced to keep a check on the Mansabdars. And uh, around the 40th renal year of uh, uh, Akbar, he introduced Mansab as a dual ranking system, which all of us are more familiar with, which is the Zat, the personal rank, and Sawar, the military rank. So each Mansabdar had two ranks, the Zat rank, and the which is his personal rank, which was based on uh, his loyalty to the Mughal emperor and the Savar rank, the military rank, that means according to that Savar rank, a particular military set of military contingent, which had horses, which had troops, had to be maintained by the Mughal Mansabdar. Is that clear? So the ruler was the sole arbiter. Uh, modifications were made in the Mansabdari system, gradually by Jahangir, Shah Jah, and Aurangzeb's time. So it wasn't that whatever was introduced by Akbar continued after him. Yes, it did. 
continue but a lot of changes were also uh, introduced in this evolution of the administrative system over a period of time mansabdari and jagirdari system explains the organization of mughal nobility mansabdars received their pay either in cash or in form of jagirs now here is where the jagirdari comes in place yes the mansabdar was paid either in nakdi or cash but yes of course so much cash couldn't be given to him so he was also given a in form of jagir a land grant a grant it wasn't it was a grant of land but it was called revenue assignment that means revenue from that land could be given to him could be was allotted to the mansabdar and that revenue was equivalent to his salary or whatever was balanced after giving him a uh, uh, cash uh, remuneration so most of them were jagirdars because the mansabdars were given jagirs most of them became jagirdars they were holders of huge jagirs they realized the revenue from their jagirs and the imperial officials were appointed to keep a check on them so of course because they were getting land and they were get they, they were they had rights over the revenue of that uh, some part of the revenue of the land the mansabdar could become quite uh, autonomous and um, uh, strong and they could be a threat to the ruler or that region yes so therefore there were constant checks and balances and surveillance over these mansabdars and a uh, mughal emperor instituted a lot of officials to keep check on them the jagir system was the assignment of revenue now the term here is assignment of revenue assignment of revenue means that land was given a land that produced revenue was given but it was an assignment of revenue that means a certain amount of revenue from that land can be taken by the mansabdar it was the most convenient arrangement in lieu of payment for services to the state ikta was the term used during delhi sultanate period and jagir was a preferable that was equal in term was a preferable mode of payment of remuneration none of these assignments were permanent or hereditary okay they were, you couldn't get jagir for your entire life it wasn't hereditary it wasn't permanent rulers kept shifting part of or the entire jagir from one part of the imperial territory to another at any time so tra constant transfers were being made jagirs were frequently transferred transferred on an average of 3 years every 3 years now there were many kinds of jagirs that were given so one of them was watan jagir that were given to zamindars in local dominions as remuneration for the mansab according to them um, uh, they were accorded to them by the mughal government for their services so watan jagir for example um uh, uh, for example the ruler of uh, jodhpur you know um he accepted the he accepts the sovereignty uh, the uh, the the sovereignty of the mughal emperor mughal emperor gives the ruler of jodhpur a mansab rank he is now given jagir because he will be given jagir he is maintaining troops on behalf of the ruler he is also uh, having a zat rank so he is being given jagir land but in his own watan in the land in the region of jodhpur he is given watan he is given in his own watan he is given jagir grant so the zamindars or the rai ranas rajputs and the local the the bigger zamindars were given uh, uh, jagir grant in their local dominions in their own regions okay again a lot of discussion has been done on watan jagirs if you're interested please look look at the uh, readings on that Altamaga jagirs were allotted to nobles in their families, town, or place of birth. Again, Altamaga Altamaga jagirs were given to nobles, and uh, again in their local towns. They were not. It's not that uh, a noble from Bengal was given land in Agra. No, a noble from uh, uh, um, um, Bengal, if he is given Altamaga jagir, he will be given jagir grant in Bengal itself, in the region of Bengal. okay uh, nobility was characterized by two important characteristics patronage of rajput chieftains at an unprecedented scale with their unfailing loyalty to mughal rulers now nobility of um, um, 
Mughal emperors, uh, nobles of uh, the nobility in, under the Mughal emperors was quite heterogeneous. It was quite diverse. People from different um, backgrounds and uh, people from different um, uh, groups of different people were uh, part of. They were Rajputs. They were, you know, uh, Iranis, Turanis. So important aspect to the nobility was Rajputs as nobles and their, their unprecedented loyalty that they gave to the Mughal rulers. That became a very strong point for the Mughal emperor. And second, Akbar's brilliance in accommodating regional or ethnic groups. Right? So Akbar was quite um, uh, intelligent and he was quite um, uh, uh, practical in understanding the Indian, the Indian dynamics, the dynamics of the Indian subcontinent. And he tried to accommodate, he tried to integrate regional and ethnic groups rather than alienating them, fighting with them. You know, he did not do that. Even if he was uh, getting into a conflict, the idea was to accommodate regional or ethnic groups. And that brought him a very stable polity, this Mughal empire itself. Yeah. So long, so long, so long as they were allowed to remain autonomous, these Rajputs, these Deccanese, you know, the Sultanate in Bengal. So as long as the local uh, rulers were allowed to be autonomous, and they were left on their own. Of course, these these people had to these rulers, local rulers had to accept Akbar's supremacy that was there. But as far as they were allowed to rule in their regions autonomously. You know, they continue to remain loyal. Yeah, Relationship of both, therefore, we see a relationship of both conflict and cooperation when we are discussing about nobility and nobles uh, uh, and the different regions uh, 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 with the uh, Mughal emperor. The Mansab system defined the hierarchies for the entire state officials, thus keeping checks and balances on Mansabdars and the nobility class. Various racial groups included um, like under Babur Humayun Akbar period, we saw Turanis from Central Asia, Iranis from Persian, Persians, uh, the Persians were called Iranis, Afghan, Sheikh Zadas, uh, Rajputs, they were there, they were a part of the nobility. And in the 17th century, when Mughal, em Mughal Empire expanded towards Deccan and Peninsula region, we see the inclusions of Hyderabadis, Marathas, the Bijapuris in the nobility class. So the central, provincial, and local administration also have to be studied, and it kept changing. Um, uh, uh, changes were brought about, smaller or bigger changes were brought about uh, with time. Please look at the details of that from your e-resource. Now, going to the last unit very quickly, um, uh, it is the successor states that came up uh, with the disintegration of the Mughal Empire in the 18th century. So I would like you to pay attention to some of these successor states. Uh, please pay attention to Avadh. If you can see Avad in the northern uh, northern Ganga uh, Gangetic Belt, yes. Uh, please pay attention to Hyderabad, which is your peninsula region, and also please pay attention to Bengal. Now, these are three regions that I will be discussing in the in my next slide. Now, uh, the 18th century successor states. Successor states. Why are they called successor states? Because they succeeded from the Mughal emperors. So the Mughal Empire was disintegrating in the 18th century because of several reasons. It was declining because of several reasons. And therefore, the all these regions, which were initially a part of the Mughal Empire, were establishing the local rulers here, were trying to, or no, local nobles here. Or at times, even the governors, Mughal governors in these regions, were trying to establish their autonomous control in the 18th century. Okay. So they were both continuities with the classical Mughal administrative system, along with some changes that were introduced in the successor states. So uh, uh, the administrative mechanism in the successor states, there were already some kind of mechanism that was there in this region, in these regions. They were continuing and most of them were quite influenced because they practiced the Mughal patterns of administrative system. So they continued uh, in, in, in their regions. Um, uh, without any uh, much change, and especially in Bengal, Hyderabad, and other, because they were very important part of the Mughal Empire in the 17th, 16th, 17th century, even the 18th century. Gradually, we see them uh, disintegrating with the Mughal center, but the administrative systems were quite similar to the Mughal uh, patterns of administrative system. 
in bengal particularly bengal had a unique position as a mughal province 18th century the power of mughal mansabdar the mughal official in bengal had weakened vis-a-vis the zamindars there were no major confrontation between the mansabdar and the zamindar the reason could be located in few number of mansabdars and jagis in bengal and the low jama assessments so again um, uh, you have to go into the details of this region to understand this concept of why bengal um, uh, did not see major confrontation between the mansabdar and zamindar and zamindar um, bengal was quite um, uh, um, um uh, it, it bengal was characterized by big zamindari so we will see that how murshid kuli khan uh, in his administrative measures he actually uh, to bring about peace and stability in the regions he encouraged the large zamindaris in fact he uh, collaborated with them so large zamindaris that came up in a big way by the late 18th century were burdwan dinajpur nadia rajshahi zamindaris and they provided largest revenue assessments in bengal so in fact jagannath sarkar uh, a very famous historian uh, studying this period describes that that these new big zamindaris were the new landed aristocracy in the 18th century there were also a, a continuation and some reorganization of administration that was done under uh, the ali wardi khan ali, uh, ali wardi khan period in bengal uh, you can study about, more about bengal if you're interested from your source e resource also uh, regions of hyderabad deccan and moguls and the nizam and avad please take a look at it in detail um, uh, from your e resource most of these regions were all, uh, were already based on patterns that were there in the mughal period the mughal pattern of administrative structures but yes they also had their own local influences the changes were brought about by the rulers and leaders at this in, in rulers and kings in these regions so uh, yes so this is it from uh, uh, my end i think i have taken exactly an hour on discussing these four units primarily the delhi sultanate so uh, just quickly the four units um, uh, please look at in detail the 18th century successor states administrative mechanism uh, from your uh, e resource because i will not be able to discuss that uh, at present in in great detail and um, with this i think we are kind of finished uh, with our discussion on administrative and uh, institutional mechanisms and i will um, uh stop sharing my screen for now and uh, uh, hand it over to dr sakir for his comments and uh, any questions thank you so much thank you ms dio very nice beautiful presentation sir and you have uh, very elaborately described all the aspects of the uh, medieval administrative institutions and structures uh, if the learners or anyone else has any questions here, they may ask to Ms. Dio directly, or may message in the chat box if there is any query or any question. Sahar, if there is any question, 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 if there is Sakir, anybody asking questions? Still, Sakir, no questions no. from anyone. And then I will Hi. say something. Yes, yes, you may say. Mrs. Tripti Deo, thanks a lot for your brilliant lecture. You have covered almost everything on such a vast topic, history of around five to six hundred years, Sultanate and the Mughals. just i would like to point out one thing in our slm one important aspect of delhi sultanate as well as the moguls have not been discussed uh, discussed and the learners must learn about it that is whether sultanate was a theocracy state or not whether the rule of the delhi sultans characterized characterized it as a theocratic state and there are a lot of controversies on this regard many historians say it was purely a theocratic state some say it is a secular state state but like two extremes i think it is in midway between a theocracy and secular delhi sultanate cannot be a secular state 
in the modern connotation of the term. And if we say it is a theocratic state because the sultans adhere to the Sharia and follow the Islamic principles. But in that also, Delhi sultans deviated from it and followed what is known as the state laws or Jawabit. il declared himself as the deputy Khalifa, but at the time of Alauddin Khalji, he discarded it, he eschewed it. And his son Mubarak Khalji himself declared as a Khalifa. So for practical purpose, there is no linkage with Caliphate and the Delhi Sultanate. Secondly, there was no systematic plan of conversion or making use of force to convert non-Muslim into Hindus. Some incentive might be there or Firosat Tughlaq tried something, but in fact, it didn't bring any fruit. Otherwise, the whole of Indian subcontinent would have become a Muslim majority state and not 12 or 30 percent in present day India. There was no systematic plan for conversion. So when we read about Delhi Sultanate, we must be objective like a historian and not go by the history books coming, which is not even worth its paper, Bazaar Gassifs. So we must be very careful and deal with this theocratic problem under Delhi Sultanate. Coming to Aurangzeb, another emperor who had been much vilified, the fault of Aurangzeb was that he didn't understand the psyche of the non-Muslims, unlike Akbar. And he began giving farmans to destroy the temples and all those things. Many of the master's historians had to defend Aurangzeb saying that his motive was not religious. They say that temples were a place hotbed of conspiracy. But whatever may be the motive of that emperor Aurangzeb, the ultimate re result was he alienated all the subjects of Mughal emperor from 1662 to 1707, whether the Jats, Sikhs, Hindus, even the Sultanate of the Deccan, Golconda, Bijapur, etc. So my point is that as a historian, we must look at it very objectively and don't have a biased opinion about the medieval India. And once again, thank you, Mr. Stripti Devo, for your lecture. And tomorrow we meet again. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your beautiful comments and addition uh, to the medieval institutions. Uh, if there is no questions, then I would like to thank Ms. Dio for our beautiful presentation uh, and uh, hope uh, next day we will meet with a new topic with again with Ms. Dio as the resource person. Uh, and I hope the students will learn a lot besides the study material from our resource person as she is dealing with different aspects of the Indian, Indian history. And I hope that if the students missed any classes, they may go to the link of the SU website and find the videos included in the website. Thank you, Mirko. And thank you, Nisan, for your cooperation as the technical assistance. Thanks, Dr. Professor Kipilishira, for your beautiful suggestions and advices. Thank you all. Your mic is mute, Mirko. Is on me. No, you are not on me. Okay, thank you, all of you. We will end the session. Thank you. Yes, we will end the session. Thank you. Thank you.